सतो मगमय तमसो मोतिर्गमय मृत्युर्मात गमय ओ शांति 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 ओ लीड मी फ्रॉम दि अनरियल टू द रियल लीड मी फ्रॉम डार्कनेस टू लाइट लीड मी फ्रॉम डेथ to immortality om peace 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 we are starting this evening today the second series in our introduction to vedanta series we have just completed one of the texts in our introduction to vedanta series we have completed drig drishya viveka we are going to start another text uh, this evening Vedanta as we are all aware is the philosophy of the Upanishads what are the Upanishads the Upanishads are a series of spiritual philosophical texts found embedded in the Vedas what are the Vedas the Vedas are the oldest spiritual religious texts available to humanity even the most conservative estimates dated back to more than 4000 years and in those vedas one finds these texts called the upanishads the upanishads taken together are what are called vedanta vedanta nama upanishad pramanam the source of spiritual knowledge known as the upanishads is called vedanta literally the word vedanta means the end of the vedas anta end veda but it does not mean the physical end of the four books you know it does not mean the end of the books of which are called the vedas but rather it means the final conclusion of the vedas about spiritual life the highest conclusion in the sense of nirnaya anta in the sense of nirnaya high, highest teaching the highest philosophy highest spiritual teaching found in the vedas is found in these upanishads these upanishads are the fundamental basis of sanatana dharma of hinduism all of hinduism is traced back to these upanishads these upanishads have formed the basis of the different philosophical spiritual systems in hinduism and uh, commentators those who have explained the upanishads to us have come from time to time and uh, among them very well known is shankaracharya maybe 1400 years ago who is the author of the text which we will take up today he come he wrote extensive commentaries on at least we know for certain at least 10 of the upanishads probably 11 and commentaries on the bhagavad gita the bhagavad gita is found in the mahabharata it is the dialogue between krishna and arjuna but krishna teaches arjuna about spiritual life and all the teachings are based on the upanishads often you find some of the language of the verses in the gita as a language of the upanishads and the philosophical discussions about the teachings of the upanishads are found in aphorisms sutras called the brahma sutras and shankaracharya has written extensive commentaries on the upanishads on the bhagavad gita and on the brahma sutra so these texts the upanishads the bhagavad gita and the brahma sutra with the commentaries of shankaracharya form the the basis the scriptural basis the textual basis of the system of non dual vedanta advaita vedanta the system that we are go- we are going we are talking about here so it's a vast literature very profound very deep his language was simple as a, one of our senior swamis told us you know shankaracharya was a 16 year old boy obviously his language was simple but simple and yet profound so the term which is used for shankaracharya's language is prasanna gambhira prasanna means lucid um clear joyful gambhira means profound and deep so that kind of language we find in the 
commentaries on the Upanishads and Gita and the Brahma Sutras. Now it's vast. Taken together, they are called the triple canon of Vedanta, the triple foundation of Vedanta, Prasthanatraya. To give us an introduction, to make it easy for us, to introduce us to Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta in baby steps, as it were, a number of other texts have been written, and these are called the introductory texts, Prakarana Grantha, introductory texts. Well known among them is Vedanta Sara, Vedanta Paribhasha, Paribhasha Viveka Chudamani, and the text which we completed last week, Drigdrishya Viveka. Among all these introductory texts, a particularly fine text is the one which we shall start today. It was written by none other than Shankaracharya himself, 1400 years ago. And don't be afraid, it's still in print. <laughs> I don't know what edition it's running to, but it's been in print. I'm joking. I mean, it is, it is mostly for, for a long time it was handwritten copies, of course, and it's only recently that it's in print. But they were written on palm leaf, on manuscripts, written by hand and copied, from, copied by, from guru to disciple. Even as early as um, 13th or 14th century, uh, about six or 700 years ago, we find another great master of Advaita Vedanta, Vidyaranya, who famously wrote the Panchadashi, another great text of Advaita Vedanta. He wrote a beautiful commentary to this text, to Shankaracharya's original text, Aparokshanubhuti. Vidyaranya wrote a commentary, a magnificent commentary. That's, that's what I'll rely, uh, rely upon when I explain this text, when we shall study this text. I shall not read out from the commentary directly. It's, it's in tough, terse, philosophical Sanskrit, but I'll translate it in, into English. So I'll rely upon that and a number of other commentators, more modern commentators on the Aparoksha Anubhuti. So I'll put it all together and then present it in this class. So the book we are going to take up is Aparoksha Anubhuti. And uh, those of, some of you, I see have already got the book, but those of you do not have it, the bookshop will be open after this class at 8.30 and you can pick up your copy of the book uh, right after the class. Um, compared to the Drigdrishya Viveka, those of you who were with us for the whole duration, 12 classes of Drigdrishya Viveka, this is a step up or several steps up. It's a very strong dose of Advaita Vedanta. What we shall see in this book is First, of course, it will introduce us to the preliminary spiritual disciplines, what is in no, known in Advaita Vedanta as sadhana chatushtaya, the basis of spiritual life, which is something we need to keep an eye on, something that we'll keep coming back to again and again. How do we prepare ourselves for non-dual realization? So that will be one, one thing that they'll talk about. Then the next thing the book will tell us about is a, is a very interesting uh, part where it deals with the question, who are we? Who am I really? We think we are the body and Vedanta tells us that you are not the body, you are consciousness and existence and bliss absolute, but that we are not the body. They tell us, but in detail, can anybody show us why we are not the body? Can anybody explain it to us? Why, are, why is it that you are saying we are mis making a mistake when we think we are the body? This book does it in detail, in painstaking detail. You know, we are holding on to the body like this. I am the body. And what Shankaracharya does in those few, uh, several verses which we shall see, he opens our death gr grasp on the body, you know, like a prying our fingers loose one by one. Uh, shows us clearly that we are really not this body. Though we work through the body, we experience through the body, we experience the body, but we are not the body. And that is shown in, the, uh, in this text. So we are the mind. And Shankaracharya next comes and hits us with that you are not the mind either. And again in great detail and with great insight, he gives us this insight, actually hands us this insight. We can clearly see the mind, after we go through that portion, we'll be able to see the mind as an object just like this. Here is an object which I see, clearly not me, 
in the same way the mind, of course not a physical object, but as a subtle object we shall see. In Vedanta, we, our true nature is existence, consciousness, bliss, absolute. We are not the physical body. We are not even the mind which is called the subtle body. The Vedantic idea of the human personality is trichotomous. Body, mind, and the real self. What has happened to us now is we have forgotten the real self and we think of ourselves as the body-mind. We have completely lost sight of what we, who we really are. And the famous, the, the very nice saying that we think we are human beings in search of spiritual experience. But the truth is we are spiritual beings having a human experience. So we have, we have lost sight of that. And Vedanta seeks to bring us back to that. Physical body and there is a subtle body. And you know, I was just thinking, the, the pure consciousness aspect which Vedanta talks about, even Sankhya or Yoga talks about it. Even some schools of Mahayana Buddhism, they talk in, in that language. Now, that is, a, uh, that is a distant goal for modern science. I mean, it's, it's nowhere on the horizon right now. But I was just thinking, science, if it could come, modern science could come to some appreciation, some kind of idea of subtle matter. Here's gross matter. And the idea right now is, whatever we call consciousness, soul, personality, something produced by our physical brains. Vedanta says, no. This body, including the physical brain, is gross matter. Beyond that is a realm of subtle matter. Sukshma sharira, subtle body. Beyond that is what we are, pure consciousness. Now, in between, this subtle matter is also something that science has not come to yet. If science could come to that, it would go a great way in uh, a great distance in, you know, um, verifying or even bringing thinking into line with Vedantic thinking. If we could somehow get some conception, some idea of subtle matter, what Vedanta calls subtle matter. And very interestingly, just today, I got three separate, three people separately sent me links to a New York Times article an article is Mind Messing with the Mind. It's, it's a very nice article on, on consciousness studies. And it's a, it's a usual article on consciousness studies. Consciousness studies is, is the field is still a mess because even the questions are not defined and there are all sorts of theories starting from the, the complete reductionist who say that there is no such thing as consciousness. You might be amazed. What do you mean there is no such thing as consciousness? What is it that we are feeling all the time? They say, no, no, it's just an illusion. It is no such thing. From that to other different different ideas. Most of them are reductionist ideas. And this article also is mostly like that. But the amazing thing is, in this article, I saw there's one paragraph which quotes one scientist, Max Tegmark in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, who has nothing to do with Vedanta or uh, Eastern philosophy or even spirituality or religion. I imagine he is as much of a uh, materialist as any scientist. Max Tegmark, he says, matter as we understand it today cannot explain consciousness. Hence, we need a new conception of matter, a new fundamental kind, a fundamentally new kind of matter. We need to posit that, think about it, which can deal with the problem of consciousness. And he says, let's call it, he, he gives it a name also. <laughs> It's not discovered or not, people have not started searching for it yet in science. But he even gives it a name. He calls it perceptronium. <laughs> perceptronium. <laughs> but you see, it's, I, I was excited to read that. These are exciting days indeed. If they come across something like that, this will be the subtle matter which Vedanta talks about. Not yet consciousness. Vedanta does not say that is consciousness also. That's, that's a subtle body, our minds. That's what survives the death of the physical body. And because Vedanta regards that as matter too, it does not regard it as, as spirit or consciousness. It regards that subtle body as matter. If it is matter, then in principle, science should be able to come upon it someday. And the very idea that it's being actually put forward, 
seriously by a materialist, complete materialist, atheistic or agnostic, noted scientist with the possibility. This is very interesting. Let's see where it goes. Maybe in our lifetime, maybe beyond our lifetime. But anyway, we come back to Vedanta, to Aparoksha Anubhuti. This pure consciousness beyond the gross body, beyond the subtle body, this pure consciousness, how do we come to understand that, realize that? In fact, the very name of the book, Aparoksha Anubhuti, if you translate it into English, it becomes direct experience of what? Of the Absolute. Aparoksha, direct, we'll deal with that term a little later. Anubhuti experience, direct experience of the Absolute. So, after showing us that we are not even the mind which is made of subtle matter, then the book will go forward and discuss the nature of the universe. It will show us that we are pure consciousness. Then what about the universe? What is the universe? What is the body? What is the subtle, subtle body? So that also will be discussed. And then finally it will show that there is only one consciousness existence reality. And then it will give us 15, no less than 15 techniques for realizing um, that we are Brahman, that existence consciousness place. If you read it, it sounds like a 15 step program, 15 steps to the real realization. But if you actually come to those techniques, you will see they are independently, each one of them is capable of giving us the intuitive realization, the direct realization of Brahman. So that's what is before us. That's the syllabus, uh, what we are going to cover. And it's a very exciting book, full of wonderful twists and turns. Just as you feel you are beginning to get the hang of it, Shankaracharya will pull the rug out from under our feet and say, it's all wrong, what you have understood till now. And then again, start all over again. So it's very interesting. Um, we shall go on this journey together. Um, let me just start with uh, the invocatory verse. And one more verse, and then we shall have some questions and answers, after which you can go and get the copies of the book. The invocatory verse is a very beautiful verse. It's a tradition in Vedanta books to start with the praise of God, to bow down to the Guru, to bow down to the Lord and seek blessings so that we can get enlightenment by this study. So let's see what he says. And it's very poetic too. Shri Harim Paramanandam Upadeshtaram Ishwaram Upadeshtaram Ishwaram Vyapakam Sarvalokanam Vyapakam Sarvalokanam Karanam Tam Namamyaham Karanam Tam Namamyaham I bow down to God, Shri Hari, another name of Vishnu. I bow down to the Lord. What is the nature of the Lord? Paramanandam. The ultimate bliss. The very nature of the Lord is bliss. I can't resist telling this, you know. People want, we want happiness. Even that is the reason for studying Vedanta. We want to overcome sorrow and attain happiness. The very nature of the Lord is happiness. Paramanandam. And... Though we are studying Jnana Yoga, the path of knowledge, let me just say this. If one wants true, lasting, unchanging happiness right now, bhakti, love, love the Lord. Love immediately brings happiness. Any kind of love brings, brings happiness. We know that. Unmixed happiness, unchanging happiness, sublime happiness comes with love of God, bhakti. Paramanandam. Shri Bhagavan is Paramanandam. And Upadeshtaram. Upadeshtaram means the teacher. In Vedanta tradition, the first teacher is always God. So all these teachings are coming from the Lord. All the, the Vedanta traditions, Advaita Vedanta, Vishishta Advaita, Dvaita Vedanta, all the, the Vedanta teaching traditions, in Sanskrit, they are called parampara. 
So they will have a lineage of teachers, gurus. And it's interesting to see in each of the lineages, they're all different gurus, different teachers. But they all trace it back to God. So in every case, God is the first teacher. Spiritual knowledge is the grace of the Lord. We keep saying, when will the Lord have grace upon me? The Lord already has grace upon us because we, are, we have come in contact with Vedanta. Vedanta is the teaching of the Lord. Vedanta is the grace of the Lord. We have this idea in Hinduism that our happiness and unhappiness depends on our karma. What we have done in this life, what we have done in past lives, the results we get in this life. If you are having a nice time of it, you had good karma. But then you are using it up. If you are, if, if you are in hard times, you are, you are facing trouble in life, well, that's because of our past bad karma. Something we have done in this life or past life for which we are paying now. And they say that if you have a lot of good karma, if you have good karma, you have a happy life. If you have a lot of good karma, you come to Vedanta. <laughs> they believe that. They believe that. You get the grace of God. To Krishna, Krishna said to Arjuna in the beginning of the Gita, without asking for it, the doors of heaven have opened to you. Such is the grace of the Lord. So, we are all what would be called in traditional Hinduism, Punyatma. People with a lot of punyam, merit, good, good karma, that we, we get to listen to this. Um, so, Upadeshtaram, Lord is the teacher, Sri Bhagavan is the teacher of Vedanta. Who is this teacher? Ishwaram, God, the Lord of the universe. That's why when we read the Gita, we are told, remember who is teaching. It's not your professor, not your pandit who is teaching you the Gita, not some Swami. The teacher there is Sri Krishna, the incarnation of God himself. So when we approach a scripture with that kind of an attitude, the Lord is my teacher. So the, imagine how much focus, how much reverence, how, how careful we are with the teaching. With the, we'll approach it with an entirely different mindset. And that helps. You see, the idea in Vedanta is not to believe the idea in Vedanta is, uh, is to experience the truth. To experience the truth, it helps to have that kind of reverential attitude, that kind of focus. Where is this Lord? The answer is, where is He not? Vyapakam, all-pervading. All-pervading. Everywhere in the universe the Lord is. Inside and outside our, ourselves. If that is so, the question is, why don't I see Him? I see everything, but I don't see the Lord. The answer to that is, Karanam Sarvalokana. The Lord is present everywhere as the cause of the universe. What does that mean? Just like water is present in all the waves as the material, the substance, the material cause. Upadana Karana. As iron is present in all iron implements, as the material of those implements, the substance out of which it's made, as wood is present in all the pews on which you are sitting, you would be sitting on the carpet pretty fast if the wood disappeared from the pews. It's the reality of these pews. It's what's holding you up. So, in the same way, the entire universe is pervaded by one spiritual cause, that is God. It's the material of the universe, the ultimate spiritual material of the universe. You'll say, okay, but I can understand what is water in the waves, I can understand what is wood in the pews, or what is iron in the implements, in our iron uh, implements, but spiritual cause, that sounds like mumbo-jumbo. What is spiritual cause here? Don't worry, the book will tell us. The book will tell us so vividly that we won't have any way of denying it afterwards. The Lord is present everywhere as the, the spiritual material the, the very ground of this ex universe we are experiencing. The cause of all the worlds. Sarva Lokana of all the worlds. Tam Namam Neham. I bow down to the Lord. This bowing down. I didn't even know that. I, I always thought bowing down is a bhakti act. An act of devotion to God. But bowing down is an act of jnana. That I did not know. As reading a Swami in Uttarakhand writes. When I bow down. Namam Neham. I bow down. 
my existence becomes one with the existence of the Lord to whom I bow down. My consciousness is surrendered unto the consciousness of the Lord to whom I bow down. My bliss becomes one with the bliss of the Lord to whom I bow down. I become one Satchidananda by the act of bowing down. Namamyaham, I bow down to thee. So this is the invocation and this is the invocation we shall chant at the beginning of each class. Now, in the time remaining to us, let's take up the second verse where we shall understand the meaning of the term Aparokshanubhuti. Aparokshanubhuti. The, the very word itself sort of contains everything that the book has to say. It's a very profound word. Second verse. Aparokshanubhutir vai Prochyate moksha siddhaye Sadhvireva prayatnena Vikshaniya muhur muhu Here is being taught Aparokshanabhuti, the direct realization of the Absolute for attaining liberation, moksha. Those who are qualified, they should intently inquire about what is being taught here. Intently, without break. Now what is meant by this? Let's go through it carefully. The word Aparokshanabhuti is something to be understood. Anubhuti, experience. Now there are three categories, make three categories of experience. The first category is, in Sanskrit, Pratyaksha. Pratyaksha. The second one is Paroksha. And the third one is Aparoksha. What does it mean? Pratyaksha. Pratyaksha means sense perception. Nothing fancy here. Whatever we see, seeing through the eyes, hearing through the ears, tasting through the tongue, all this is pratyaksha. Aksha literally means the eyes, but also means sense organ. Pratyaksha, every sense organ. The knowledge that we gain through each of the sense organs, the experience that we gain through each of the sense organs is called pratyaksha. Seeing with the eyes, we see form with the eyes. Right now we are seeing it. This is pratyaksha. We hear sound with our ears. That is pratyaksha. Taste with our tongue. Pratyaksha. We touch with our skin, pratyaksha. Smell with our nose, pratyaksha. Five sense organs, five kinds of knowledge, pouring in all the time. All of this is called pratyaksha. In English, sense perception. It's a direct translation. Now, there is another set of experiences we have. We, have, we get knowledge in another way. Based upon what we see and hear and taste and smell, we think about it. We draw conclusions from our thinking. This is called inference, anumana. The whole of science is here. Make observations, study it, think about it, draw hypotheses and confirm it or deny it and you get some knowledge about the world. Inference. The whole of science is observation and then inference. Methodically, systematically. Nowadays they use statistics, everything from a simple chemistry experiment to finding the Higgs boson. All of that is a kind of observation. Our senses are boosted through telescopes and microscopes and even more powerful devices like particle accelerators and so on. But even after you've got the devices, even after you get the observations, then you have to make an inference based on the observations and come to some kind of theoretical conclusion. That knowledge which we gain, which we do not directly see or hear, but based upon what we see or hear, we get some knowledge. And that knowledge is called paroksha. Look at the term. It's a precise term. Paroksha means beyond the knowledge that we get, beyond the sense, beyond the range of our sense organs. That which lies beyond the range of your eyes, which you cannot see with your eyes. You take an observation and make a, a theory and say, okay, so everything is made of atoms. We have never seen an atom. But with the effects, with the observation, we come to an understanding, so we have the theory of atoms. I was in Cambridge 
last year. And this young uh, physics scholar, scholar of physics, who works in the same department as Stephen Hawking. He took me to Stephen Hawking's office. Uh, no, I didn't see him rolling out in a wheelchair. I was expecting him to see him, but I did not. He's retired, but he still comes in. He has a separate office, and it says Stephen Hawking. But then we were walking through Cambridge. It's a small university town. And then he took me into a little lane. I thought we had such little lanes only in India. Even a single car cannot enter. A motorcycle can enter. It's paved, cobblestones. And then we entered that, and dramatically, that young scholar told me, Swami, the modern world was born in this lane. What do you mean? Here is the place where the electron was discovered. Here is the place. It's a pub, he says. Here, just next to it. Here is the place where Watson came up, Watson and Crick, they came here for a drink and talked about it. They were talking, discussing the structure of the human DNA. And they sketched it out there, the helix. That's where this is the basis of physics. This is the basis of modern biology. Our entire genetics, our entire electronics, uh, to our computer science, everything is all based on the discoveries made within not walking distance, stepping distance, few steps here and there, two places, in that little lane. Anyhow, all of scientific knowledge is inference based on observation. All of religion is also based not on observation directly, but on faith. You read about it in a book, it is also paroksha. You read about it in a book, you have faith, you, you perform some act, some rituals or something, and lead a life in the faith, in the hope that after death I shall get my reward, I'll go to heaven or something. Now this heaven, this merit which I'm accumulating through religious acts, this is not something I observe. This is something on belief, on faith. So faith is also paroksha. Now we have two categories of knowledge. One is pratyaksha, what we see, hear, smell, touch. And one is paroksha, the si entire realm of science which we have developed on observation and inference. And the entire realm of religion, entire realm of religion which we have developed on the basis of faith. Revealed scripture, I believe it and I, am, I shall practice accordingly. That's also a kind of knowledge. That's also a kind of knowledge. And that knowledge is also, is called paroksha. Paroksha literally means beyond the limits of our sense organs. Yes, heaven, I might one day see heaven. Or if I'm particularly naughty, the other place. <laughs> but, but right now I do not see it. Right now it is beyond the limit of my senses. Until I die, I cannot say, I can sense it directly. So they are paroksha. But Vedanta is neither Pratyaksha nor Paroksha. Vedanta says it deals with our own real nature. It deals with our own real nature. We, it, which you, the existence, consciousness, bliss which we are, which is not something that you can see with these eyes. It's not something that we can hear with these ears or taste or smell. We cannot do that. And yet, it's not something that's beyond our experience. Paroksha is something that you have to believe. Do you have to believe that you exist? No. Our own existence, what we are, our consciousness just now, is not a matter of belief. In fact, it is a stronger kind of experience than both Pratyaksha and Paroksha. It is based upon our, we, our consciousness first, that our sense organs operate and give us pratyaksha knowledge, sense perception. Based upon the consciousness that we have, our mind operates and we get scientific knowledge or religious faith. Both pratyaksha and paroksha depend upon the direct illumination, the direct light of consciousness shining forth within us all the time. You don't require proof. Why not, Swami? Think about it. People keep asking, is there proof of God? Can you prove the existence of God? Every religion struggles to prove the existence of God. All theistic religions struggle to prove the existence of God. 
None of them struggle to prove your existence. It's beyond question. Nobody asks a question, that, uh, do I exist? You might ask, does my body really exist? Does my mind really exist? But do I exist? Nobody asks seriously this question. There's no need to prove that. In fact, we shall see later how Brahman, the Vedantic conception of God in, in uh, Brahman, also does not require any proof. It's self-proved. A Swami in Uttarakhand in the Himalayas asked a question to a Vedanta teacher. Swami in Hindi, Ishwar ke astitwa me akatya praman dije. Give me an irrefutable proof of the existence of God. Give me an irrefutable proof of the existence of God. And the immediate answer was your own existence. Tumhara astitwa, your own existence. Because as we shall see, our existence, existence of the true self within us, of the Atman, is not different from Brahman or God in Vedanta, in Advaita Vedanta. So our very existence becomes a proof for the existence of God in that sense, in the Vedantic sense. Now, this self-illumined existence is called Aparoksha. Aparoksha. What does Aparoksha mean? Not Paroksha, indirect. Indirect, not direct. Not indirect. Aparoksha. So is it Pratyaksha? Is it sense perception? It's not sense perception either. It is, so is it beyond sense perception like God or heaven or black holes? Not that either. After all, how can you be beyond, beyond your sense perceptions? Now, the exact derivation of the word I will give you, Vidyaranya Swami in his commentary put, gives us it. It's a dense commentary, but uh, very fascinating. One sample will show you what, what he is saying. Aparoksha, how does he derive the word? He says, Akshanam indriyanam param atitam na bhavati iti aparoksham. Akshanam, the, the indriyas, the sensory system. That which is beyond the sensory system. Right now we are sit sitting here and um, um, the Pacific Ocean is beyond our sensory system. In the sense that it's too far, we cannot see it right now. So it's beyond our senses. Is the self, is Brahman like that? Very far away so that we cannot see it. No, 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 no. Not like that. It is not something that is beyond your senses. So is it, can you see it with the senses? No, no, no. You cannot directly see it with the senses. Something more than that. What is something more than that? And the commentator exp explains. He says, Adhishthanam prakashakatya. It is the very ground of the functioning of the senses. It is revealed, your own existence is revealed in every functioning of the senses. Every time you see something, every time you hear something, every time we think of something, every time we feel something. When you say, I don't understand what he is talking about, it is that self alone which is being revealed. You say, okay, I get it now. It is that very self which is being revealed all the time. It is pure consciousness itself shining through our minds and our sensory system. So the term they use for that is aparoksha. It's a very carefully chosen term. And it's a term which can apply only to the Atman, to the pure self, to Brahman itself. Aparoksha. Not sense perception. Not beyond sense perception. Rather, the very ground of sense perception. The illuminer of all the senses. When Sri Ramakrishna was asked by Swami Vivekananda, Narendranath went around asking, Great spiritual teachers in Calcutta in those days, Sir, have you seen God? And nobody could give a direct answer. Or the answer to satisfy um, Narin. And when he came to Ramakrishna Paramahamsa, and he asked him, Sir, have you seen God? Look at the answer. Yes, I have. As clearly as I see you. More than that. And what is that more than that? What is that more than that? Seeing you with the eyes is pratyaksha. Realizing the ultimate truth with that we are Brahman is aparoksha, something more powerful than pratyaksha. Even what we see, we can be deceived. We can be deceived by what we see. There are visual illusions, optical illusions. We can be deceived. But that our own existence is existence, consciousness, bliss, that we can never be deceived. Now, he says, how do we know this? This aparoksha. One more point. One Swami makes a very interesting point. He says, Pratyaksha, 
is samsara. What we see is samsara. Paroksha, beyond our senses, is, he says, swarga, the, the heaven promised by religion, is beyond our sensory perception right now. Only belief. And he says, the um, self alone is aparoksha. The self spoken about in Advaita Vedanta, you, who we really are, that is aparoksha, immediate non-mediate and direct. So, he calls it sthula drishti, sukshma drishti, tattva drishti. Sthula drishti, a gross vision. A gross vision of the world is, a gross point of view of the world is what I see, what I taste, what I can touch, what I can grasp. What an animal perceives its own environment to be. The senses alone. That's, that's the world that's called a gross vision. Then sukshma drishti, a subtle vision, is a vision that a scientist has or a man of religion has. Subtle vision is, I, I see this, but I understand what it is through science. I see this gross world and through my belief in religion, I know that God exists and heaven exists and all the morality has its reward and all these things. This is called sukshma drishti, subtle view. And third he says, Tattva drishti, truth view, reality view, which is Brahman alone. Neither this world, nor the promised next world, but the reality of both of them, which is Brahman. Isn't it a beautiful idea? Stula drishti, samsara. Sukshma drishti, the world of science, the world of religion. Tattva drishti, the truth point of view, is the self alone existence consciousness place. He uses a little term here, way. It means certainly this is not a theory. It is, the, it is the wisdom of the enlightened masters throughout the ages which is being handed down to us. It is a, it's their experience. Religion is realization, Swami Vivekananda said. That realization is being handed down to us. It's not a speculation, not a theory. David, this is just a teaching methodology, a pedagogy, a spiritual pedagogy which will take us, if we walk with them, which will take us to that vision which the great masters of humanity had since ages immemorial. We will get that vision. That is the promise. And one more point. It's a very essential point. It's really essential to grasp it. The commentator points it out so beautifully. He says, if we are qualified, and what it means to be qualified, he'll explain. And how to get those qualities, he'll also explain. But, if things are ready, how does enlightenment come? He says, jhatiti, in a flash. How does it come in a flash? Here's the crux. Here's the difference between this and all faith-based approaches. It says, if we are already Brahman, if the Lord Brahman is present everywhere and in our every experience, then why do we not realize it? This is the only thing possible is that we are ignorant of it. It's right there, we do not see it. Right? It's right there and we do not see it. If I'm looking at you all and somebody says that... Um, um, uh, I, I'm, I'm looking at this audience and I'm asking, where is Rakhal? And somebody says, he's right here. I said, where is Rakhal? And you get up and you point out to me, Swami, that is Rakhal, there. Now I say, okay, I see him. Now, did I see something new? I was seeing all of them, but I did not recognize Rakhal. Somebody came and pointed out, that is Rakhal. All I needed was not a, new not a new experience. Not a new experience. Not a new practice. All I needed was pointing out. Pointing out. The commentator says the whole technique of this book is pointing out. This book is going to point out. There will be numerous practices, numerous recommendations. Everything will come and go. But the real thing is to grasp here is the pointing out. 
the 15 techniques which will come at the end, they are all pointing out techniques. The core of Advaita Vedanta is that the teacher points out to the student who is ready. Here is Brahman, see. It depends on the illumina illumined teacher and the ready student. Swami Vivekananda, sitting in Belurmat courtyard, talking about the realization of God in the courtyard of Belurmat. People coming and going. And then Swami Vivekananda in an inspired mood, you know, he says, do not seek him, see God, see the visible God, see Brahman now. And the way he said it, it uplifted the minds of all present there. And they soared into some unnameable, um, you know, uh, bhava. And they felt the presence of divinity. And the more prepared they were, the more intense was that realization. Swami Premananda, one of the direct disciples of Sri Ramakrishna, was passing by with the offerings, with the thali, with the, with the plate of offerings to the Lord, which is there. He was passing by with that. And when, when Swami Vivekananda said this, he was not even listening to the talk. He just heard, see Brahman here. And he went into Samadhi. He stood there like a picture with, with, with the plate in his hand and one foot in front of the other and stood. Completely lost to the world. And the description is there of that scene, how for a long time, there was absolute silence in that courtyard. And slowly their minds came down. I think Vivekananda himself told Premananda, Babu, Babu Ram Dadi move. You can go now. So, pointing out is necessary by an illumined teacher. But yes, you can say that, is it all that easy, Swami? Well, the, I must admit it's not all that easy. We can go on pointing out all our lives and we won't see anything until we are ready. And how to get ready, uh, what is that pointing out? This is the, what the book is about. But this crucial insight the commentator has shared with us, teaching here is pointing out something that already exists within our experience, it is to be pointed out. For what? He says, moksha siddhaye, for attainment of liberation. What liberation? Traditionally in Hinduism, say moksha means liberation from the cycle of birth and death. But suppose somebody says, well, I know I have been born and I am sure I will die, but whether I existed earlier, whether I will be reborn again, all these are things that you Hindus believe or Buddhists or Jains or Sikhs, all the Indian religions believe that. I may not believe it, I don't know it. That's also a matter of faith. Why should I work for a liberation from a problem which I don't know whether it exists? Why invent a problem and invent a solution? Uh, so, oh, I just remembered something very funny. There's this quack, a doctor, it's a real case, before all these medical systems came up, um, in the frontier towns and during the westward expansion, people took medical help where, where they could find it in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. So there's a, this place where a quack who was giving prescribing med medicines to anybody and everybody and charging money, um, this, uh, this person was arrested and the judge said, sentenced to such and such so many years in prison, what was the charge? The, charge was, the charges were um, inventing Inventing imaginary cures for real diseases and real cures for imaginary diseases. <laughs> Freedom from the cycle of birth and death. Well, if you believe in it. But what if I don't? So the commentator there helps us. He says, moksha means freedom from suffering. Attainment of happiness. Now that is not theoretical. Everything else in life may be theoretical. But this one thing is not theoretical for any living being, let alone human beings. Every living being is struggling to escape suffer, suffering and attain some satisfaction, happiness, joy in its existence. Attainment of bliss and escape from suffering, release from suffering is, the, is what is called moksha, freedom. So this is the goal. And this is promised to us. Who will attain this? Sadbhi. Those who are qualified. Sadhu. The commentator says sadhu bhi. Who are qualified? We will discuss it in the verses to come. What are the qualifications? And how to attain them. And how do you do that? 
He says, Vikshaniya. Vikshaniya means inquire. What will be presented to you over these next few verses? Inquire about it. What is inquiry? Listen, think, meditate. Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana. When? Twice a month, Vedanta class? He says, no, muhur muhu, from moment to moment. And the commentator is humorous there. Remember, he's writing for monks. He says, moment to moment means you should forget. Snana bhikshadi vismaranam. Forget your daily the, the bath. And you might forget it here, but you can't forget it in India where it's so hot and, and uh, sweaty, you know. There you will forget your bath. To, 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 you know, you're so immersed in this. You'll forget. And bhiksha. It's one thing that the monk does not forget, it is a daily round of begging, his food. <laughs> he says, you must be so intense that you will forget to take your bath and you will forget to go for bhiksha. I remember I used to uh, stay in Gangotri and taking a bath was really difficult there because there's water, but it's ice melted water coming down from a stream. And it's terribly cold. It just, it's not ice, but it's melted from ice just then. And I had this tin bucket, not a bucket, it's a tin actually. I had to fill it up from that and then just sort of pour it over my head. And to screw up my courage for that, I would tell myself I'm not the body, not the mind. I'd literally do that. I would chant Shankaracharya's famous Nirvana Shatakam, Mano Buddhya Hankar Chittani Na Chidananda Rupa Shivoham Shivoham and pour the water on, on top of Shiva. And Often I would chant the whole uh, hymn through before I could dare to pour, pour the water. But once you do pour the water, it's all right, you're safe. I mean, nothing worse can happen to you then. So, you will forget to take your bath. You will forget to go for food with that intensity. Is it possible? Yes, it's possible. We read about Trigunatitananda Maharaj studying Vedanta in the Baranagar Mat, in the early days of the monastery, of our monastery, the disciple of Sridama Krishna, Trigunati Tanandaji, who came here to the San Francisco Vedanta Society. Uh, he is studying Vedanta, I, I have read the description. He sits in the morning, and throughout the day he gets up only when the sun has set and there's no more light in the room and to light a lamp and sits down again. He was like that. He sits for meditation, japa, Repeating the mantra from early in the morning and then people go for their bath and food. No, he's not getting up. Not coming for food. The people are, others, other monks are worried. Vivekananda and others, so Mahapurush Maharaj and others. And he says, no, I will not stop japam till I get, I will not stop repeating the mantra till I get realization. He says, you will starve. He says, all right, I'm ready to starve. <laughs> and then finally a compromise was worked out. I think it was Mahapurush Maharaj. Swami Shivananda, for whom he had great regard. He says, if you sit there and repeat the mantra, I will touch your body and eat food quickly. <laughs> so he agreed, and that was arranged. He touched him and ate his food, and then again started doing the mantra. So that kind of determination, says the commentator. Otherwise, no amount of pointing out will. You know, I'll point it out and I'll enlighten it immediately. Not, not so fast. So muhur muhu, moment to moment inquiry. Hear it again and again, think about it again and again, and meditate upon it, till the pointing out becomes effective. When it becomes effective, even for us, enlightenment will come in a flash. The commentator says, jatiti pratyaksha. All right. Um, is, uh, are there questions? We'll, go, we'll take one question, one or two questions, and then the bookshop is going to open at 8.30. Yes, there's a question there. This isn't a question kind of a compliment, it's kind of a compliment because uh, my question was going to be, who are the qualified ones? Yes. And as we went through the whole lesson, uh, you came at the end to tell us who the qualified one was. So it's... it's yes. Uh, so the question is, who are the qualified ones? Right. And, uh, well, there's a whole set of verses waiting for us. But basically, Vedanta is very clear about this. Vedanta sets the bar high. Qualified, fourfold qualification. Viveka, Vairagya, the sixfold discipline, Mumukshutvam. What does it mean? Viveka, the ability to discriminate between what is real and what is unreal. What is truly important in life and what is inessential in life. 
And the second thing is vairagya, that which I have found to be real, I will hold on to that, that which I find to be unreal, I'll let go of that. This is called vairagya, dispassion. There is a six-fold set of disciplines which we will see. The body and mind must be, senses must be disciplined, otherwise they're going to disturb us in spiritual life. They have been, they have become wayward over years and lifetimes of misuse and abuse. Then, munukshutvam, an intense desire for this enlightenment, for this liberation. So the persons who have this, they're qualified. You say, Swami, I can see people looking rather, you know, frowning. Swami, that, that leaves me out, I'm not qualified. No, we are qualified. The very fact that you're sitting here on a Tuesday evening, you've taken the trouble to come here and listen to Vedanta, shows that there is an intuition, an inkling in all of us that there is a spiritual reality. It's true in some level, something deep within us responds to this. There are millions of people in LA. They're not here, thank God, we'll create a traffic <laughs> of monumental proportions. But, but why only you have come? There is something that is awakened. There is the grace of God, there's no doubt. And there is also something which responds from within us. That is Viveka. Only it has to be strengthened. It's weak now. It has to be strengthened, nurtured. The flames have to be fanned. Vairagya, that you have given up umpteen other possibilities in, uh, for this two or three hours you spend coming here, attending the class and going up. So many options are there. In economics you speak about opportunity cost. Uh, so, that is Vairagya. Only it has to be strengthened, made consistent. So we shall see all these qualities in, in uh, classes to come. Question? We can take one more. Yes, there's a question there. Just wait for the mic microphone. They're recording this. Well, I don't want to sound uh, ignorant. Uh, hopefully I didn't miss out anything, uh, what you've said. But um, concerning... Um, uh, from any, uh, um, from what I understood, the meditation is an ongoing thing all the time. It's, it's, you could devote yourself to being, to my understanding, to praying to God from moment to moment, almost in a way. Um, my question is, uh, I come from um, a, more of a, as you said, it's an experiential thing, right? Yes. Um, the, the, the hard part here is how do you, like for people who don't pray or are more inclined, let's say, to meditation and focusing on the breath and all that, uh, because people have different personalities, some people don't believe in pray. Yes. I, is there another way? All right. We just don't have time for this now, but I'll just touch upon it. And then please bring up this question next time. Do remember. Or if somebody else remembers, bring it up. You see, there are fundamentally two approaches to spiritual life. Your question was, suppose a person doesn't believe in prayer. Some person's attitude is different. Uh, is there a way for that person? There are two fundamental approaches in spiritual life. One is, I am searching for God. God exists, I want to find God. That's one broad highway, a freeway in spiritual life. Many people are on this path. And there's another path who's not so much God-oriented, but who am I? What's the reality within me? That who am I? The quest within. That's also spirituality. In fact, I was in charge of teaching novices, monastic novices in Belurmat, our main monastery. And I used to ask these young men, what are you looking for in spiritual life? And I got these two answers. Some of them said, I'm searching for God. Some of them say, said, I'm searching for who am I? And both are valid. Now the real, you see, every religion, maybe I'll take a few minutes, two or three minutes, instead of pushing it over to the next class, let me just talk about it now, two or three minutes. All religions of the world can be divided into these two approaches. The God-oriented approach, all theistic religions, all of Christianity, most flavors of Hinduism, worship of Vishnu or Shakti or Shiva, God-oriented, theistic. All the Abrahamic religions, Judaism, Islam, 
as I said, most parts of Hinduism. So they are theistic, God-oriented. And that's one valid major path of spiritual life. That's true also. But suppose someone is not like that. And there is also another broad highway in spiritual life. Buddhism, for example. Buddhism. In Hinduism, the path of yoga or sankhya. Where the quest is, who am I? You will find in the God-oriented religions, it's a faith-based approach. You believe in this. It starts with faith. It's based on shraddha, on faith. On the other hand, these approaches are more based on, you will find, uh, on meditation, on inquiry, on looking within, on mindfulness, the who am I approaches. So these are two broad highways in spiritual life. There are advantages and there are disadvantages in each, each path. Briefly speaking, what is the advantage and disadvantage of the God-oriented path? The disadvantage of the God-oriented path is it starts with faith, what you said. Suppose you cannot believe. More and more people in the modern age, they find it difficult to start with belief. And even if one comes to belief, that belief is always subject to being shaken. That's why in all the theistic paths you will come across doubt. For a long time, until one has that supernatural, that super conscious experience, until that time, there's bound to be doubt. Because you're starting off with faith. People get faith, struggle with it. You come to so many stories of great spiritual uh, seekers who have doubted, found faith, lost it. You find so much efforts to prove the existence of God. Why so many efforts to prove the existence of God? Because it can be doubted. And it is doubted. So that's the disadvantage of the uh, uh, of the God-oriented path. Now what is the advantage of the God-oriented path? If you have faith, your problems are solved. God is infinite. God has no problems. God will take care of us. We surrender. We accept everything uh, in the light of God. The opposite holds true for the who am I inquiry. There you don't need faith to start off in the sense that as I said, that I exist. I don't have to believe in it. I, it's, it's a fact for me. It's a clear fact for me. I don't have to s prove that I exist. But that's no, uh, no comfort. That's cold comfort because I, this, my very existence is beset with all these problems. All my efforts are to solve the problems surrounding my own existence. So the existence of the self is not a problem in this path. But the self is surrounded by infinite problems. In the other path, God has no problems at all. God is infinitely powerful, blissful and joyful. There is no problem at all in that path, except whether God exists or not is, 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 the, is the question there. Now you have these two paths. Now follow carefully, I'll bring it to a conclusion. What we do here in Advaita Vedanta, and this is magnificent, what we do here in Advaita Vedanta, Advaita Vedanta says both these paths lead to the same realization. Where does it say so? When Advaita Vedanta says, Tat Tvam Asi, that Thou art. The that there stands for the God-oriented approach. That stands for God. Thou stands for the you-oriented, self-oriented approach. And he says, when you inquire along both paths, you will come to the same reality. As the Sufi poet said, when I searched for God, I found myself. When I searched for myself, I found God. So this is the wonderful uh, you know, synthesis which you find in the non-dual approach. Both of these. And the advantage of the non-dual approach is, I'll give this as an assignment for you, it combines the advantages of both and leaves out the disadvantage of both, uh, both approaches. The infinitude of God and the certainty of your own existence become one. You certainly exist and you are shown to be infinite. The doubts that, that you know, pursue the existence concept of God are no longer there. And the limitations that surround the individual existence, those are removed in this path of non-dualism. This is the beauty of the path of non-dualism. All right, we'll bring it to a close here. And the bookshop is open now, I think. Yes. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupa Namastu